Oh no. Perfect. Oh, awesome. You, and we can hear you. <laughs> And we have some attendees who are just starting in. Sometimes the webinar just starts automatically on the hour. So we get to welcome Allison and Angelo and Benita and Dimitrios and Fiona and Jude and Tosin. Everybody's coming in now. We have Nabukai, William, two Williams. Hi to Kirk and Jerome, uh, another Fiona. It's really lovely to have all of you. Welcome to the OUM virtual space. I'm Associate Professor Nicolette McGuire, and I'm Associate Dean for Student Engagement at OUM. And I'm joining you all from Anishinaabe territory in rural tiny Ontario, Canada. And I just want to acknowledge with gratitude the people and lands of Samoa that unite our university across continents and time zones and even languages. So I have two very special guests I'm here to connect with you all this morning, this evening, this afternoon, whichever time zone you happen to be in. That is Mr. Norman Chu, who is a preclinical student and a student ambassador. And Mr. Walter Ikealumba, who is a clinical student and a peer support facilitator. So I want to thank you both for joining me uh, this evening, this morning, this afternoon. Welcome. Thank you, Professor McGuire. Thank you, Professor McGuire. Who are um, joining us as attendees to our webinar? If you have questions for Norman and Walter throughout the session, please do chat, type them in the Q and A window, and I will read those questions out and have Norman and Walter answer those. So I have a number of questions myself, um, but you can go ahead at any time point during the webinar. If you have a question for Walter or Norman, you can go ahead and type that into the Q&A box and we'll do our best to answer those questions as well. So we'll start with you, Norma. Norman. Will you please introduce yourself and let our attendees know where you're from? Yeah, sure. Um, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Norman and I am actually based in Australia, uh, originally from New Zealand. Um, I'm also just under a year and a half into my preclinical studies. And I think I do have one full year left before uh, my clinical. So it's definitely um, getting really exciting. <laughs> um, I'm also currently working as a support worker, a disability support worker here in Toowoomba. Uh, and it's, it's quite a fulfilling um, position that I'm doing right now, I think, just because um, prior to starting this, I've I, you, you learn about disabilities and whatnot, but you never really understand what the patient goes through day by day, you know, and what the challenges that they face. So I think this is really great that I'm, I'm able to do this casually while I'm doing my uh, preclinicals, definitely. Um, but that's just about me for now. And did you have any more questions? <laughs> Well, if you think, I mean, if you didn't think that was enough accomplishment for Norman, he also devotes some of his time volunteering as a student ambassador for the university. And we just finished our orientation week for our most uh, recent cohort, and Norman was a really big part of that. So thank you for doing that as well, Norman. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> uh, Walter, would you please introduce yourself to our attendees today? Oh. Hello everyone and welcome. Um, my name is Walter. I'm a fourth year uh, student uh, currently doing my clinicals. I'm also based in Australia in Perth, Western Australia, um, same as Norman. Um, so yeah, it's, I came from a background of engineering and um, before coming into medicine. Um, similar to Norman, I also do disability support at the moment. And it's really good to be able to see and connect the parallels, as Norman has mentioned, between you know, understanding why or the pathophysiology between, behind certain um, conditions and you know, how better to help these patients um, uh, deal with the conditions they're living with. So yeah, that's the little bit that I have about myself. Thank you. 
Thanks. And I do want to ask you a little bit about your engineering background because we do have a few applicants and we have a few new people in our cohort with engineering backgrounds as well. But I first want to ask you, why, Walter, did you apply to OUM? How did you end up in our community? Yes, so with um, OUM, I, I initially wanted to study medicine actually before I got into engineering. Um, but I wasn't able to get into engineering at the time. So I, I completed my engineering studies and I went back and did a PhD in chemical engineering as well. Um, after that time, I was looking, I was still, I still had that passion for medicine and I was looking for a way to get into medicine. And I applied through the traditional Australian pathways, which means sitting the GAMS at and then applying to certain universities. And as most um, Australian students would know, the GAMSAT um, process does have a few challenges. Um, aside from being a yearly intake for the universities, they do have that hurdle of meeting certain um, criteria. So, you know, during the process of applying, I was faced with having to wait a certain, possibly one or two years before I could actually get in. Um, and I heard about OUM from my dad. He knew some colleagues who had completed um, studies through OUM. My dad's a GP. Um, so he knew a few colleagues who had completed uh, medical studies through OUM and were uh, practicing. So he mentioned OUM to me and, uh, and said that I should give it a shot. And I did, and I'm happy to be here because OUM does offer a lot of flexibility in terms of you know, directing your learning and being able to complete your studies in a way that fits, um, I believe, most students because we are, most of the cohort tends to be the mature age students who have you know, families or certain things they're trying to balance. And OEM does offer that flexibility that we're able to manage that as well. So I'm happy to be with OEM. Yeah. We're really glad you're here too. And uh, OEM is really proud to be able to offer an admissions process that doesn't include the GAMSAT. It's a very comprehensive um, process and we look at our candidates holistically so we don't require uh, the GAMSAT for admissions. Um, so what about your engineering kind of background? Do you think there's anything about having an engineering background that you've applied at all in your studies at OUM? Um, when I think about it, I mean, in retrospect, I would say there might be bits and pieces that I, I have applied. It's, you know, when, when I mentioned to um, colleagues and friends that I went from engineering to medicine, they say that's quite a big leap. It's two different fields, you know, um, but at the fundamental engineering and medicine, it's, it's sciences, you know? So if you have that passion for sciences, you should be able to transition from one to the other. Um, and, you know, I like to give this analogy for, for those with an engineering background. You know, when you think about the body, it's basically a machine, a biological machine. You have structures supporting these muscles. You, you have forces working different biomechanics. If you're concerned the cardiovascular system, it's basically plumbing, you know? You've got a pump, the heart, you've got pipes, and everything's just flowing. So it's it's all engineering in a sense. It's all science. And I think if you have that passion, um, whether it's for science or whether it's to help people in terms of medicine, you should be able to transition from one to the other. And another thing about engineering is most engineers are trained to be problem solvers. We're, we're trained to be uh, critical thinkers. Um, so that's, that's the fundamental of engineering. You need to someone comes to you with a problem and you need to find a solution to this problem. Um, and I believe that's a big thing in medicine as well. So a patient presents to you and you look for certain patterns, which could fit a list of different diagnoses. And you have to use your critical thinking process and you know patterns that you've recognized from studies or past experiences to try and narrow down to what this patient actually has. So I believe there is quite a lot that you can transfer from engineering to medicine. The love of science and the use of critical thinking really rings true for me as well, because I'm a professor in preclinical science, as both of you know, but perhaps our attendees don't know. So I, I like that you highlighted that. 
Norman, let's hear a little bit um, more about you. How did we get so lucky to have you, Norman, in the OUM community? Tell us a little bit about why you decided to apply to OUM. Yeah, sure. Um, unlike Walter, my whole family actually, you know, they, my whole family, they're all engineers, literally. I come from a background of engineers. I didn't know that. <laughs> I was going to say, unlike uh, Walter, I decided not to, you know, it's one of those, like, I don't want to do what you do, Dad, I'm going to do something else. <laughs> um, so so what actually happened was um, I, I knew in, during high school, even though I was gearing towards an engineering degree, and I actually got accepted into an engineering program in Auckland, um, I decided that I wanted to give biomedical science a go. Um, I've always been sort of um, leaning towards sort of the health industry, even though uh, not necessarily medicine, it definitely did toy um, with me when I applied for biomedical science. So I don't think I mentioned, but my background is uh, in biomedical science and I went all the way up to a, a master's. Um, I think for me, um, my first exposure to OUM was actually uh, one of my university um, classmates that um, I graduated with. Um, one day we kind of lost touch, but I saw him update, updated his profile saying that he studied medicine in OUM. I was, like, I was like, oh, that's interesting. You know, what is OEM? What's Oceania University of Medicine? You know, and I clicked into it. That was back in 2014. I didn't think too much of it. I was just like, that's interesting. Uh, meanwhile, I powered through to um, completing my master's degree. <clears throat> and after finishing my master's degree, I was offered like a PhD position to do, um, to start, um, you know, they try to do the whole spiel of money and all that <laughs> being paid for. But I was like, you know what, one full year in research was a lot. I was spending easily 15, 16 hour days in the lab, seven days a week to the a point when I finished my master's. So I definitely could have finished my, done a PhD, but I was like, well, I think I needed more sort of a human touch in terms of science. Like Walter said, you need to have the love of science and that's what I did, you know? So coming out of that, uh, I came out to work for a little bit. And for some reason, I was just thinking, why not try medicine, All right? I was like, why, why don't I try for medicine? And like Walter, set the game set, give it a go, you know, even though my science was uh, right up there um, in terms of the marks, the section one and two, which I don't know if anyone else is familiar, is the writing written part and the, you know, more sort of English literacy uh, part that I just couldn't get over the threshold. Well, I got over the threshold, that just wasn't good enough. I was always edging close. Uh, so when I was sitting there and I saw my friend actually graduated from OUM, you know, from back on in 2014, and I was like, well, let's have a look, let's see what this is about. So that was back in 2019 when I started my journey with OUM. And I think it must be coincidence because I was, I just moved from uh, Auckland to Brisbane at the time. And I was researching, you know, sitting in Gamshead and researching other um, universities and again, came across OUM. By luck or by chance, I met another graduate at church. <laughs> So he, he literally just graduated back in 2014, uh, 17. Um, and he was he was doing his um, internship, I think up in Harvey Bay. Yeah. And I was like, must be a sign, you know? Uh, th and that's when I went full ham. I went to talk to uh, the admissions team at the time and started the whole process. Now it wasn't two year, until two years later that I got admitted, but I had a lot of, um, different things to consider before fully getting into it um, because I would have just started working and then there's the money aspect and all that I'm sure we'll go into later as well but th that is my exposure to OUM and why I decided to do it because I now know personally two people that are actually working in Australia who's actually finished um, their degree from OUM. Well, while, while we've got the admissions process kind of front of mind, I did want to ask you a question about that. Is there anything that prospective students should keep in mind um, about being part of the admissions process? Would you have any advice about going through the admissions process for anyone here attending here or reviewing this session via recording? Yeah, definitely. I think because uh, OEM is quite, it's very self-directed learning. Um, 
there is definitely a lot of support that OEM does offer. Um, but the main point is, you know, we can't force you to study. So the same rings true in terms of um, the admissions process. You do need to do your research. Um, I did read through the student handbook at the time, you know, front to back, <laughs> um, researching all of that, um, making sure that's in line with what my expectations were. And I also, um, you know, scoured through the internet, um, looking for uh, ways to practice if I was an OEM graduate. So all these things do uh, play a role. So in terms of the admissions process for me, uh, it was a lot of researching and making sure that, you know, this is what I wanted, you know, and once I've decided that, yeah, that's what I'm going to go for, you know, um, make sure I have all the documents in place, you know, some things take a little more time than others to get, you know, you might have to do blood tests or whatnot, <laughs> um, you know, um, and all the information, you know, sending it through cross countries, you need to bear in mind what the time is. So again, your research, you know, have everything calendar written down, you know, um, I think that's that's the biggest um, take home I'd like to um, keep. That's the message I'd like to send, yeah. I think research is always important, always knowing kind of what you're getting into and what you're looking for. I want to mention too that although neither of you got to benefit from this, those who are attending today will, there's been a, um, not a complete overhaul, but definitely a lot of resources added to OUM's website. So there's a lot greater wealth of information on all of the different programs that OUM offers, the, the curriculum, the resources, the faculty that, um, and so on and so forth. So I would encourage those of you who are attending live or who are attending via recording to have a deep dive into the website. Um, and also to connect with your admissions counselor if you have questions about your specific situation. Um, so I want to talk a little bit kind of about the unique setup of OUM because we have both virtual and in-person components. I don't know if either of you are part of learning programs that had both virtual and in-person components before. So for example, in the preclinicals, you have virtual classrooms, we conduct classrooms and articulate. And in Zoom, where you have a live um, professor facilitating a session and students having a discussion or participating in the lecture. And then you also have asynchronous components where you're able to um, watch recorded uh, resources um, asynchronously. You have textbooks that are all online in clinical key. Then you have your in-person components. So you're meeting with your clinical mentor, um, you're um, going to live clinical skills course, and of course you're going to live clinical rotations. We don't um, offer a full set of virtual clinical rotations, although we do have some electives that are offered virtually as well. So I wanna maybe ask you, Walter, first, um, you know, what should students keep in mind kind of about participating in a program that's a mix of virtual and in-person type components? Yeah, I think that's a good question. And I believe that is one of the benefits to why people choose uh, to join OUM due to that flexibility that it allows. Um, I believe students should, you know, it, the fact that we have this virtual um, space, um, it allows us to connect from different locations. But I also, what from my personal experience, I would encourage students to try and attend the live sessions if possible. Um, you know, with, during these live sessions, whether uh, lectures or the mini cases, uh, when you get into your SBMs, it allows students to be able to interact with other students and with the lecturers um, at the same time, um, allows you to ask questions and, you know, get things clarified. If you were to um, attend asynchronously via recordings or something, um, then you probably wouldn't have that chance to be able to interact with other students and with the staff. You could still ask your questions because, as Norman mentioned, OUM does provide a lot of support for students. Um, staff are very happy to answer questions via email or to be contacted. Um, but I believe that live um, interaction allows you to ask your questions as you see them and while you're hearing these uh, presentations. So it really allows you to interact in that sense. But again, I, I do believe that 
you know, the fact that we have this um, setting in OUM gives us a lot of flexibility and allows people to, you know, manage their time much more effectively. What would you say about that, Norman? Because you're at a point in the program where the majority of your components are virtual. Um, what would you say that students should keep in mind? And, you know, have you ever had an opportunity to meet in person with any of the staff or students? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think my first opportunity to meet the staff and students, which I did, um, was at the student conference. So I do encourage people to do attend uh, if they get the chance to do that. Um, because I think in, in my experience, um, I find, well, actually it's been pretty good for me. I, I have reached out to a lot of people. And so I do have a pretty good community around me, but I can imagine that it will be quite isolating for some people purely because this is um, uh, a lot of online work, but I just want to bring it back to when I was doing university, you know, some 10 years ago, um, and I was attending live lectures back at Auckland University. And honestly, uh, we, we started having a lot of pre-recorded lectures and I think pre-recorded lectures, honestly, is a great way to go because a lot of people have very different learning styles and just, for me, sticking to an eight o'clock schedule for uh, your first thing in the morning class where I had to travel, you know, half an hour just to get to you know, university. So I'm already very groggy as a 21 year old or 20 year old university student. So what sort of value was, uh, was there with me being in a live lecture or really tired, you know what I mean? So I was like, well, the, the recorded lectures are great because then, you know, I can know that, all right, I have a set schedule, you know, that works for me. And if I, I, I can choose to study during, you know, my most energetic time when I'm like fo most focused. That's why I think like, honestly, um, I don't know why people were sort of skeptical about online learning, you know, see what, what happened with COVID, you know, everyone's gone online now, except, you know, OEM's done it better than everyone else, you know. Um, we have more experience. So <laughs> definitely, definitely, definitely helped. So I think when COVID happened in terms of the uh, education side, it was like, yeah, we got it. <laughs> uh, so I think um, it's great um, if you can build yourself a, a community around you, that's definitely important um like joining your cohort groups um you know and meeting people at the student conference and keeping in touch i think that's a great way uh, to stay in touch uh, but in terms of the online learning um yeah it's definitely been a, a great tool for me myself anyway i think the kind of interesting thing for me is that you can be like a really introverted person and if you don't want to interact with anybody you don't have to. You don't have to see anybody live if you don't want to, at least for the first couple of years um, of the program. But if you're more of an extroverted person or you kind of are a mix between both, you have the opportunity to do that as much as you want to take advantage of it. So I think yeah, no, there's a good the, mix the, for that. Yeah, sorry, yeah, definitely. Uh, I was going to say, sorry, Walter. <laughs> I was going to say, that, you know, if like Walter said, definitely do attend the live lectures because um, before starting my job, I had the opportunity to you know, attend every single live lecture. And that, that was really um, the highlight of my day every time, you know, um, because we're at, a, we're at a level where you, you get to, to um, discuss in person with all your, all your friends and that's online without interrupting the lecture. You know, you can never really do that, um, you know, in an in-person lecture theater. Yeah. You know, especially because my experience with in-person lecture theater, sometimes your lecturers don't even want you to ask uh, questions, you know, uh, whereas during um, a live lecture, you can ask your questions and when the lecturer is ready to answer your question and they will do so. So I think that's that's really great um, if you're able to attend the live lectures and, and I do encourage everyone to do that. Okay. Sorry, Walter. Walter, <laughs> yeah. did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, and just to add on to what Norman was saying, you know, with the um, how it could be a bit isolating, uh, I think that's probably a very big thing for a lot of students to keep in mind. You know, the fact that this is an online, especially in the first few years, being an online driven learning process, um, students can feel that isolation. And, you know, it's, it's easier when you're in a traditional, you know, uh, school where you can actually meet students and discuss. Um, as Norman said, most locations tend to have other students within that area. 
for example, Norman and I, we're based in Western Australia in Perth, and we have this um, Facebook group where we add other students from our location, and we organize um, meetups during, you know, different times to try and get us to come together and to interact. In addition to that, he mentioned the WhatsApp group. So for our different cohorts, you create WhatsApp groups, and then you can discuss any issues you might have, and you can even organize a meetup with some other students that might be closer to your location. So it's it's it can be isolating, but there are tools to help to alleviate that. So if, as um, Professor McGuire mentioned, if you're introverted and that's how you learn, then that's fine. But if you do want to get involved and interact with other students, there are so many ways to do so. We also have an OUM student association that's pretty active and they organize events throughout the year and students do, I think it's kind of cool that students are able to form groups and connections with people from every country that OUM serves, but then they also can have subgroups where, oh, here's those of us that are in Adelaide, here's those of us that are in Auckland, and, and you guys can meet up together and have study groups and all of that. So it's kind of a unique mix of, of doing that, which I think adds the uniqueness of an OUM classroom and an OUM experience. Um, so I want to ask you both whether you think that OUM has more of kind of a collaborative environment or are students more competitive? What kind of drives the, the community at OUM? What's it like to be amongst the other students? Maybe Norman, if you'd like to go first. Uh, I think definitely uh, my experience is definitely collaborative, um, but then I think it's also a environment that as students, you um sort of dictate you know if you, you if you're a personality that ends up becoming really competitive and um i haven't actually seen any of that students here especially but definitely uh, back in auckland there were a lot of um especially biomed right um a lot of people were competing um towards a particular spot in medicine so nobody was sharing notes everyone was you know um not really helping each other out whereas i think with oum we all knew what it took to get us here. So a lot of it is you do want to see other your other students succeed, you know, especially while I have um, someone that I'm, I'm a bit closer to um, in my cohort. Um, and a lot of times we bounce off ideas or um, bounce off, say, notes to, or, or for, uh, to, to each other kind of stuff. So then I think that's a great way because we both end up better for it. So, um, because there are certain times when I'll write some notes that I might have missed a section off that he does have, that he has, you know? Uh, and I think definitely my experience is very collaborative. What about you, Walter? Yeah, I mean, I don't have too much to add. I agree with Norman. Uh, it's been a very collaborative um, environment. As you mentioned, we all know um, what it took for us to get here, and most students are there to help each other. People come from different backgrounds. I'm an engineer. Some students are nurses. Others are phys physician assistants. So people have all these different knowledges that could assist in different ways. And I believe we will. We might touch on clinicals, but you know, when you get to that clinical aspect as well, this collaborative environment does help, you know, with that process as well. So I've, I mean, that that's the main thing that I've noticed. But, you know, aside from that, we, amongst students, we do have, people in general tend to have a natural, you know, competitive drive behind them, you know, most, most people want to succeed. So, I mean, between my cohort, I know there are other students that we we tend to compete with each other. Now, you know, we ask each other, well, what did you get for this quiz? All right, next time I'm going to do better than you, you know. So we do have that competitive drive amongst ourselves, but it's more collaborative. We all want to see each other succeed and we help each other in ways that we can. Thanks. Um, I do want to ask you both a little bit about both the clinical and preclinical portion of the program when we're just going to do the like 10,000 meter views. We don't have time to go through the whole <laughs> clinical and preclinical experience in our webinar today, but um, I'm going to ask you, Walter, first, because we were talking a little bit before the webinar started um, about your rotation. So maybe just tell me, how are your, tell us, how are your rotations 
going? Have you had a favorite clinical experience or clinical case so far? Yeah, so I started my clinicals last mid last year. Um, I've completed radiology, um, general medicine, ED, and I just completed pediatrics last week. Um, and the next rotation will be general surgery. So I think clinical um, is a very interesting um, part of the program to be in. You know, we get to apply all these different things that we've learned during our preclinicals, and it's actually quite exciting. You know, again, coming from an engineering background to this, I was a bit worried as to how I'd perform in the clinical setting, but it's actually very exciting. You know, if you've done your studies in the preclinicals, by the time you get to clinicals, you should be very confident and you find the things actually quite exciting. Um, my most, I think pediatrics was my favorite clinical experience so far. And I believe it just had to do with the relationship that I formed with the consultants. You know, different hospitals and different locations could have, you know, a different way the consultants interact with the students or they might be too busy and then it's left for other, you know, registrars or RMOs to do the teaching for the students. But during my pediatrics rotation, I did have a lot of time with the consultants and they were able to, you know, basically think out loud with a lot of the um, presentations that came. So they would have these discussions with me, with the patients there, and it actually helped to solidify my learning experience. So I think pediatrics has been my my favorite and clinicals is definitely something to look forward to. Yeah. Um, I just, there's a couple of questions in the chat window. Um, one is from Peter, who's in Townsville and has a bunch of questions about clinicals. So Peter, go ahead and ask them in the Q&A and I'm happy to pose those to Walter. And the second one is from Sekaren, who appreciated your feedback, Walter, on in-person participation. Um, and I think that that was about the, the um, virtual classrooms and wanted to know, is it mandatory? And what time of the day do you have to have these sessions in the first two years? So Norman's closer on the, on the preclinical side than Walter, so we'll let Norman ask that one. So is it mandatory? Do you have to go to the virtual lectures live and what time of the day do you have to go? Well, they usually um, they usually happen around this time of the day, and while they might not be um, mandatory, it's definitely um, worth going to as many live sessions live sessions as you can. Especially um, the one I'm in my system based module now, and we have many cases. Uh, as I understand, they are integrated with um, the new cohort now. And so these these mini cases, I think, are very sort of um, high value sessions that you do not want to miss. One, you do get um, sort of um, extra credit for it uh, if you do attend and participate. Uh, but for me, the the most important part of that uh, mini session is that I have to go home and you know look through um, different case studies and actually research the case studies before I present them. And as, as I understand, that's very similar to how you probably would do it um, during your clinical rounds. You know, let's say you have the, um, um, the doctor in charge there ask you these different questions that you'll see in your mini cases anyway, and, and then you'll have to present that to, um, to the attending doctor. So I think that's a very good sort of way to help you get the skills that you need in a safe environment. So, because everyone's new, everyone doing the mini case, everyone's nervous, you know, um, but after you do enough of them, it's just free flow. You know, you're, you've, you're in your groove and yeah, you're ready for this. So I I, I was very worried about um, clinicals, but I think as, uh, as the more mini cases as I go through, um, I am feeling a little bit more confident um, in presenting them. So. So yeah, while it might not be necessary, definitely you should attend as many as you can. And um, we've just started, um, just this January now, offering two live session times. So in addition to, this is 8 p.m. Eastern time, which is the time zone I'm on, that's the live class time, but there's also a second live class time, which is 8 p.m. Australian Eastern time or Melbourne time. So it makes it a bit 
um, more easy or more convenient, more flexible for students to be able to attend those sessions live now that we offer them at two, two separate session times. So I, I asked well, Walter about clin clinicals. <laughs> so I'm gonna ask you about preclinicals, Norman, the 10,000 meter view. So are, are preclinicals hard? Is it hard to get through the preclinical curriculum? What would you say? Um, honestly, I think the content itself is not hard. It's just the volume. So depends what you mean by hard, right? For me, I have a biomedical science background. So the concepts, a lot of it is not too hard to grasp, but it's just the volume that you do need to spend a lot of time on. Uh, it's just no two ways about it. You can definitely understand, um, you know, the content very well, but, you know, come exam time, there's 10,000 different things that, you know, little details that you got to remember. So um, it's, it's definitely very doable though, uh, because we do have a lot of students from various backgrounds that didn't come from a biomedical science background who perform well. So um, take that as it is, you know? I love that we have a real diversity of backgrounds at OEM. So we have students from biomedical and engineering backgrounds like the both of you. We have students who have healthcare backgrounds. We have students that have no, sci no scientific and no medical or healthcare backgrounds at all that come into the program. And really you get out of it what you put in. There's no shortcuts in learning medicine. So um, there's, there's also no advantages or disadvantages of a various background. And the fact that you come from that background means that you're welcomed and have a really great perspective, particularly when you go into a discussion session, because you may, Someone who is a teacher may have a completely different perspective than someone who came in with a nursing background, for example. And I think that really actually helps with a very healthy discussion within a classroom. So um, I want to ask you both, because you both do so much, how do you kind of stay on top of all of your commitments? So how do you manage your time to really stay on top of life to stay up on top of your studies and your assignments and your work and volunteer commitments how do you what's what are your tips for managing time how do you manage your time maybe walter you'd like to go first um i think you know with time management it comes with experience i think that's the best thing to say um most of uh, I assume that most of us have gone through a certain degree and have picked up some sort of skills along the way in terms of how to manage and structure our time. Um, with the um, OUM or medicine, as I mentioned, it, it offers that flexibility. So it really depends on what type of lifestyle you have or what other commitments you have outside studying medicine. Um, so those things will have to help you determine how you structure your time. As Norman mentioned, he might come back from work and he's tired, so he can't attend the live lectures. So, you know, he'd find a different time to participate. So it, it really depends on the um, lifestyle or other commitments that you have. But what I would say, you know, with, as Norman mentioned, the preclinicals, there's a, there's a high amount of information to get to. There's, there's a lot of volume. So in terms of managing time there, I would suggest, you know, trying to, the way I did it basically was to start ahead of time. So if I know that next week we're going to be covering certain topics, I'll start before that week starts, you know. So, for example, now we you just completed or, orientation week. If they've got the materials for when they're supposed to start, they should start now and start going through that material to prepare themselves. And I think that that was my technique. So trying to start ahead of time. And then if I had to revise things, then I could go through those things during the week as we went along. It's not always easy to stay ahead of things. You know, sometimes you, more, you might fall back, but then, then you'd have to restructure things. You might have to take certain things out of your life. And, you know, when we um, talk about time management, I think it's very important for people to realize the amount of time required when studying medicine. Um, there are so many challenges, especially for those that have families. Um, the families, you'd have to have discussions with your family and they'd have to be understanding about the amount of requirements um, that this would take. But again, you know, I, I've, as Norman mentioned, he's done research, I've done my PhD. So I, I know what it's like to be locked away doing 
lots of research for many hours in a day. So what I would also recommend is that you find a good balance. You know, it's it's good to study um, and put a lot of time towards studying, but you'll also need to, you know, set aside some time either for family or for something that you do enjoy doing. Um, it's very good to maintain that balance because if we don't maintain that balance, you, you'll... I don't think you'd be able to make it through. Um, it's it's very very challenging. So you need to, you you really need to find that balance. Um, but yeah, to to summarize, in terms of time management, it it really comes down to the individual. What other factors do you have in your life, and then you can sort of shuffle around and find what works best for you. When you get to the clinical phase, um, I personally believe it's much easier actually during the clinical phase to to find that balance because. We spend most of, of our time in the hospital and then outside that you're doing your own studies. Um, so you have a structured time that you're required to be in a hospital. Uh, then out of that time, now you can sort of organize, you know, what other activities you have set up for yourself. And as Norman mentioned, you know, during the preclinical phase, we have a high volume of information. By the time you get to your clinicals, you shouldn't have as much of a volume because you've covered all this information in your preclinicals, and now you're just really revising that information and trying to apply that information in a clinical setting. So I believe it's much easier to actually manage your time and your studies during the clinical phase. But still having that support of family members, if you have that. Yes, definitely, <laughs> and very helpful. Maintaining an awareness and a balance for your time is important. What about you, Norman? What do you do to manage your time? What would you advise about time management in preclinicals? Well, thanks, Walter, for that um, clinical side. It's definitely something to look forward to, <laughs> especially when now, now, as you mentioned, the preclinical is pretty full on. <clears throat> so definitely time management is very, very important. And um, I think the most important part is to remember that, you know, even as you're going through the different um, systems the different topics you might need a different study um way of study to say the previous topics that you've done that's definitely my experience because <clears throat> a lot of it is me trying to work out what was the best way for me to study and to retain the information um, and i think the the biggest tip i can give is to work out the time frame that you need to achieve those goals. So once you know those time frames, then you can slot them wherever you can fit them, essentially. You know, I'm not saying don't don't, you know, give up, give up that social life. You you do need to go out and see people once in a while, right? Some people do need to attend church. Some has um have kids to look after. Heads off to um, parents who are actually studying through OUM, and there's a few of them. I I don't know how, but they manage. That's the thing; they do manage. We and, have quite and, a few people who are who are parents. Definitely, and um, <laughs> I'm not one yet. But that's the thing. I, me and my partner are planning right to eventually have kids, and we're planning to have a kid. Uh, you know, during during my time at OUM, and that's that's the important part that you need to understand the amount of time that it takes you to um, to absorb certain material to do your readings and then you can plan accordingly so that's that's my experience so again i i think i've said in the previous session you know for a mini case study i know that it'll take me three hours for one question and where i find those three hours is actually quite flexible and that's a good thing about oum is that you can manage your own time and so for me say if i have a shift and i think there was a question regarding you know support and Sophia work. was asking about managing the online classes in your work schedule if you would yes and I was, I was gonna, yeah uh, and th that's a that's a good question because you know lucky for me i do have set um participants that i look after and which means i have a set time so I do um, work around those times in terms of my uh, studying and whatnot. So I, I I do tell work that look I don't work on Mondays because we're that's that's during our sort of test day or exam day most of the time, and I block that out for a revisit revision session. So that's that's my my block of time to study uh, more intense study anyway, and for the rest of the week and you know um, my job starts during lecture time. 
yeah, in the morning. So I can't attend the live le le um, lectures anymore. <laughs> but um, after I finish, you know, my whatever three or five hour shift, you know, I have a break and then I do my three hours for the mini case the next day. Um, just how my work is set up, I wanted to attend the mini cases. So it's after that, I know after my work, I have my three hours that I've got to go through. <clears throat> and don't forget, you have also two hours of lectures um, to go through as well on top of doing your mini cases. So all, all these things you just need to be aware of and, you know, and plan for essentially. So if you are able to do your mini case research, say a day before, then you've got that extra three hours to do your lectures instead, you know. Um, but say if you if you miss that timeline, and that's why it's important to make a schedule and stick to them. If you miss that timeline, that three hours is still going to happen. <laughs> so you got to fit that in somewhere, you know. Uh, and I uh, and look, it's it's totally fine to say um, not be fully on top of it as long as you're aware um like there are times when i you know have to wake up three hours earlier just before the mini case just to finish off a question yeah. you know and and i do that because it's something you just got to do but I'm as long as you, can, you got you got to be committed no, i mean medicine is not easy and um i do have medical friends um throughout the years before i started medicine and <clears throat> one quote that really stuck to me is like, like you're not studying for your grades, you're studying for the patient that you're gonna eventually see, you know? So yeah, the grades are important, but what's more important is that you don't miss anything important when you're a doctor. So I think I think uh, from that on, I was like, oh yeah, 100%, that you're not really studying for grades as you were say in your undergrad degree, when, you, when you're studying in medicine, you're studying for your future patients. Thanks for answering those questions about work-life balance. I see that Tosin had a question about work and study balance as well, and is also a support worker. So Tosin, you're in very good company um, with our, <laughs> our special guests tonight. And I just, there's a couple of questions I just want to clarify before we move on um, about, Jude wanted to know what time of the day do lectures start and when do they end? Um, and Sekaran had the same question about 8 p.m. Australian time. So the current times for the live sessions are um, 8 p.m. U.S. Eastern time, which is 10 a.m. Australian um, uh, Brisbane time, which is 11 a.m. Melbourne. Is that right? Or is it 9 a.m. Melbourne? I'm asking someone in Perth <laughs> and so, someone in yeah. Brisbane, the Melbourne time. Sure. So, they, so they start at, at Brisbane time, 10 a.m. and go to noon, or they start at Brisbane time, 9 p.m. and go to 11. So there's two, two times per day. All the live sessions are two hours in length. Um, okay. Um, Anonymous said, it seems like it's a challenging job if one has a young family and no other family support. And I know that um, although Norman and Walter said they don't have children, they have, they do have families who they have to support and families who they, who support them. And what I would say um, as the Associate Dean for Student Engagement and someone who talks to every single one of the students at the university, that one of the biggest factors success, of success at OUM is having a strong support system in place. And that can take many, many forms. So definitely if you are someone who has a family, it doesn't matter the age of your children or the presence or absence of a partner or the age of your parents or the fact that you're caring for them or they're caring for you. If you have a strong support system in place that is understanding of your personal and work and academic aspirations that is able to support you, that makes a real difference. So that support system can be those immediate um, or extended family members. It can be your um, cohort, it can be other students at OUM, 
Um, it can be your a community group. It can be um, a religious organization or group of people. It can be your um, mommy and me group. It, it takes many, many forms. But one thing that all successful OUM students have is that they find ways to have a support system around them, people who can can step in when they need, who are there to offer all different forms of support, whether that's in-person in support or support as a friend, someone to someone to vent to, someone to connect with, and so on. And then you also have all of the supports of um, the staff at OUM. So we take a real strong stance on support for um, our students. So we have two members here tonight that are part of those support programs. We have a student ambassador and we have a peer support uh, facilitator. I'll let them talk a little bit about why they wanted those roles in a moment. Um, but in addition to that, we also have an academic advising program. So when students start in the program, they're matched with an academic advisor who stays with them throughout the preclinical portion of the program and meets with them weekly for all kinds of academic needs and is also also becomes part of their support system is aware you know when things things don't go as planned for that student and is available to offer support um, we also have our clinical mentors which support students through their programs we have the um, OUMSA we're about to start um, a peer mentorship program. And of course we have my office, the Office for Student Engagement. I, um, although I'm on a different time zone than you know, a lot of a lot of people at OUM, um, I and really other other staff members really make a strong effort to be available to students who are in need. Um, we also have a 24-7 advising program. So if you're kind of main academic advisor isn't available to you and you really have a burning question about thyroid nodules at two o'clock um, in the morning, you can post your question in the 24 seven academic advising form and get a, get a response for that. So we take, we take student support really, really seriously at OUM and we wanna make sure that, um, that students have their support system around them, but also that we create a really strong level of support around each and every one of our students. So I want to ask you both um, about the program, student support programs that I just mentioned. So Norman, you are a student ambassador. Can you tell our attendees a little bit about what a student ambassador is and why you decided to be part of that program? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think my part of um, being a student ambassador well, my role is to really support the students um, whenever they need me in terms of their uh, sort of preclinical studies or just during their studies in um, OUM. So if they ever need anything that they uh, feel like they need someone to talk to, I'm happy for them to reach out to me. Um, and also if they have specific questions regarding, you know, um, my my personal experience in terms of study, uh, in terms of how um, I get my support around me or, you know, even financials, I, I get all sorts of questions that people come up to me. And <clears throat> part of um, the reason why I decided to join this student ambassador program is um, ever since I've updated, say, my professional profile um, with, you know, the fact that I'm studying at OUM, people have been reaching out to me and, and, and you know, through those platforms. And um, I've, I've always just answered them, you know, because I feel that I wanted to give back because I've already made it and I've, I'm, I'm here, um, you know, you know, achieving my dreams and all that. And I do want to help someone else. And I think that's sort of the um, attitude um, that a lot of students have as well anyway. Like, you know, we're all here finally making it. So why not uh, give a helping hand? I think for me, the best part was, look, I get a, I get to put something on my CV for something that I'm doing anyway. So why not, you know? <laughs> so yeah. yeah. That, it's not like you just get that for free. You've had to put a lot of work into that so far. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, uh, but I do enjoy it anyway, uh, you know, because I end up, um, you know, staying in contact with the people that I've helped through, you know, and I've helped a couple of people into the program. Um, and, you know, I, I do sometimes reach out to them, ask them, you know, how they're going when they're starting and how they're finding it, you know, and a lot has been pretty, pretty, pretty positive. So that gives me a kick as well, because, you know, I'm like, yes, it's not just me making it, you're making it too, you know. Um, so, so that's the attitude that I bring anyway, and I, I definitely do enjoy that. So 
Uh, it's it's not something noble. I think it's definitely selfish. That's really for my own benefits because <laughs> I, I love it. Well, I mean, that's true too. We do want to provide opportunities for our students who are performing really well and are doing really well academically in their studies, are performing really well in terms of their ability to help help others and to, you know, add, add things onto their CV, but also to provide some leadership opportunities for, for students like yourself, Norman. So I'm not, I'm not surprised that you that you say that, and nor do I think that, that that isn't a good outcome of that program. And we may have some attendees who are joining us live this, this evening, this morning, or who are joining us via recording that would be interested in taking advantage of some of the leadership programs um, at OUM for those purposes as well. So Walter, um, you are a peer support facilitator. This is a new program at OUM and it's part of OUM's mental health and well-being approach. And it's really an opportunity for students to be able to have some peer support if and when and how they need it. So OUM students are really the only people who know what OUM students are going through and can really understand what OUM students are going through. So they're really the best ones to be able to offer that peer support, that empathy, a listening ear, referral to support services and all of that. So that's why we created um, this program. It's a student-led initiative um, and it is also student-supported initiative. So can you tell us a little bit about why you decided to become part of this program? Why did you want to be a peer support facilitator? Yeah, so as Norman mentioned, you know, it's um, we really want like seeing our peers succeed as well as we're going through this journey. And as you mentioned, we we're going through this program, so we understand some of the challenges our peers might be facing as well. You know, going through um, my clinical rotations, you know, medicine in general is not easy. But then we have all these other challenges, as we mentioned, some people are working in the earlier stages, others have families to support, you know, so there's a lot to consider and some individuals can be faced with certain challenges and, you know, as we mentioned as well, the environment that we're learning in can be a bit isolating at times, so mm -hmm. it's, it's very easy for people when they are faced with challenges to feel alone and be locked away and there are some unhealthy ways of dealing with these challenges so you know I faced some challenges myself I faced burnout you know going through some of my clinical rotations especially doing ED we know ED environment can be quite quite hectic um, so I, I do understand where some of the problems and challenges that my peers could be could be going through and I really had this passion and desire because as we mentioned this is the first time this program was created you know, as soon as I saw the email come through about this program, I, I felt that I had to do something. I, I felt that I had to be a part of this because as a person, I really like seeing others succeed. A, a bit like, as just like Norma mentioned, you know, it's, it's a bit of a selfish thing in a way because I feel happy seeing these other people happy. So it gives me great pleasure to be able to help others. And I, I really want to see others succeed. I, I know some of the challenges they've faced and I can understand where they're coming from. And, you know, over the past, I've been told that I'm, you know, I have a very, I'm very empathetic. I, I have a very good, I'm very good at listening. You know, um, I do have a very keen fitness background as well. So I really like seeing people in the best place that they can be. So, you know, I joined this program to really help, you know, students to, overcome some of these challenges to provide a listening ear even if it's not you know that the, it's not really a, a challenge per se they just wanted to reach out to someone to have a conversation about something because they felt alone maybe or they just felt isolated yeah. they just wanted to have a chat you know and that's that's why I'm here you know that's why I wanted to join this program to help all these uh, my peers basically feel supported and feel comfortable as we go through this journey because at the end of the day you know if we're all not in the best mindset or feeling fulfilled ourselves then we probably won't make, make the best doctor, doctors down the track so I'll, i'd like to see everyone you know 
feeling comfortable, feeling happy as they go through their careers to become physicians later down the road? Yeah. I mean, definitely students will have ups and downs and where they're at and just removing that barrier for them to be able to reach out and just say, hey, look, I'm having a hard time right now. And for somebody to be there to support them through it, that understands and has been there too, I think can be really powerful. So I'm really glad you decided to be a part of that program. Walter, thank you for doing that. So we're just about at the end of our time. We have still have some like great questions um, in the chat uh, box in the Q&A about admissions interviews and uh, placements in Australia and where clinical rotations are completed. Um, but I'm gonna let the, <laughs> I'm gonna let those be answered by our admissions officers another time because what I really want to ask to end this session is what advice you would both give um, to our prospective students who are here live or who are joining us via recording. What advice would you give them about? applying to medical school about applying to OEM, what would you say? And Norman, why don't you first? Um, my advice is to really figure out the why, and that's going to help motivate you throughout medical school. Why, why are you applying for this? Because <clears throat> it is a tough program. You do need a lot of um, support system around you. So a lot of times when it gets tough, it's the why that really gets you through. So understanding why you're doing this, why is this a career that you find is suitable for you, and that would really carry you through into, during those really difficult study times. Thanks, that's my advice. Yeah, that's great. What about you, Walter? What advice would you have to those here today or joining us recording that are interested to apply to medical school? What advice would you give them? Yeah, I think Norman picked what I would have said, um, you know, having that passion, if without that passion, it becomes a bit challenging. You know, if you have, you need to, you need to know why you're here. Um, that will, as you said, motivate you. But I think another thing for students to keep in mind is we have um, talked a lot about support systems, you know, having a really good support system. OEM does provide a lot of um, support services, as we've mentioned the ambassador roles, the peer support programs, the staff are always there to help. But having your own support systems can be very beneficial. You know, medicine is not easy. It's, it's a challenging journey and it's a long process as well. So having a good support system, as we've mentioned, whether it's family, friends, or others in the community can really help you during those difficult times. Thanks, Walter. So Nwaboke and Alex and Allison and Bella and Benita and Comfort and Demetrios and Fiona and Jerome and Kirk and Jude and Param and Phil and Roderick, Sakarin, Tofia, Tosin, Victoria, William and Angelo. Thank you so much for joining us here live. I know that y'all each join me in thanking Norman and thanking Walter for their honesty and candor and their time taken away uh, to join us in the session and to provide um, some further information to those of you who are interested in learning more about OUM. So thank you so much, Norman and Walter. It's been an absolute pleasure talking with you today and wishing you best wishes as you start um, your course next week, Norman, and as you start your general surgery rotation, Walter. Thanks again. Bye Thanks, for now, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.